Ireland was traditionally one of the most Catholic countries uh, in Europe until quite recent years, but uh, there's no doubt there has been a very dramatic uh, falling away from the Catholic faith in Ireland caused by a number of factors. I think many people were culturally Catholic, uh, but perhaps not quite seriously practicing their religion. They were, as one person put it to me once, they were waiting in the hallway with their coat in their hands ready to, ready for the exit. And many of them have chosen to take that exit over the past uh, 20 years or so. Uh, church attendance now is very low in Ireland. As, as recently as the late 1980s, it was in the range of 70 to 80 percent. Uh, I think it is now in most areas less than 10 percent. Um, now, having said that, I don't want to be all negative about it. There are many very excellent uh, Catholic groups, including many youth groups who are doing, organizing many conferences or trying to practice their faith seriously. Uh, and that's, that's certainly very welcome. So it's, it's by no means all negative. Many of the younger people who are still involved in the Catholic Church are highly enthusiastic. I think traditionally Irish people, they sort of took Catholicism for granted. Uh, it wasn't a challenge to them because everybody was Catholic. It, it was it was part of being Irish, was being Catholic. That's certainly no longer the case. And you now have to fight your corner. You have to defend your position as a Catholic. And there's no harm in that because it does force people to question their faith. Um, younger people, not terribly interested uh, by and large. But as I said, there are many youth groups who are very interested. Uh, and people do come back to the faith. Uh, many, it's, it's a typical pattern would be people have no interest in their teens and their 20s, but by the time they hit their 30s, by the time they begin to undertake serious family responsibilities or business responsibilities, they need something more than the uh, vacuous and empty culture uh, of today has to offer them. Well, the purpose of the party is its name is Irish Freedom Party. Uh, and there are a number of areas in which the freedom of the Irish people uh, has been attacked in recent years. Uh, that is particularly in the area of uh, religious worship, in the area of freedom of expression. I think you see the, the same thing happening internationally. You see, you see the same thing happening throughout Europe and in the United States. There's an increasing intolerance for a diversity of opinion. Uh, there's an increasing intolerance for rationality. We're moving in a very specific Marxist direction internationally, uh, and it's, it's highly intolerant. Um, the people who claim to promote diversity will absolutely not accept diverse opinions. Uh, they will only expect, uh, accept one type of narrative of, of how society works. Uh, we're very concerned about this. Another aspect of, of what our party promotes is independence from the European Union. Um, the European Union started life as the European Economic Community, which was essentially a trading bloc. And when Ireland joined the European Economic Community, that's what it was seen as, a free trade area. And, People were not afraid of it, but it has morphed into a highly centralized, uh, bureaucratic, uh, centralized state, which has no respect whatsoever uh, for the democratic wishes of its, its individual member states. There are two examples in recent decades where Ireland voted against specific uh, proposals of the European Union where they wanted to centralize the power of the European Union, and effectively Ireland's wishes were ignored. Uh, it was a founding principle that uh, progress could not be made without all members being on board. But that is largely ignored now. And Ireland was threatened uh, that if it, it did not come on side with what was being proposed, that they would be thrown out of the European Union, they would be left isolated. And for uh, Ireland is a small country on the periphery of Europe. And while we fought very hard for our independence for many, many centuries, uh, it's, it's not a nice place to be completely isolated from the, the main centers of commerce and, and government, and people are very nervous of that. Now, I, I think there is a reaction to that throughout Europe. I think that many, many states, including Italy, including France, Hungary, Poland, so on and so forth, they who, particularly Poland and Hungary, who came out of the old Soviet Union system, are seeing a very strong similarity between what's happening in the European Union today and the, the terrible um, structures that they came from in the 1990s. And they don't want to go back there. Hungary in particular is deeply concerned about the aggressive anti-democratic posturing of the European Union uh, and is, is going to try to hold that up. Now, it's, it's important for Ireland to be on a similar side to that. Uh, we need to maintain our independence, we need to maintain our sovereignty, uh, and the European Union will tend to work against that. It, it's a very centralized structure with France and Germany at the center. I think the reason that Britain left is because it, it felt, its people felt it, it ceased to be an independent nation. Uh, Britain has a big enough internal market to survive outside of the European Union, but many people in Ireland feel that perhaps we don't. 
I think that's a big mistake because there are other trading blocks outside of Europe uh, on which Ireland can call. We have significant resources in terms of fisheries, in terms of wind energy and so on and so forth. And uh, with a bit of thinking and uh, a bit of goodwill on both sides, I think we can negotiate an exit from the European Union or perhaps force the European Union into becoming more responsive to the needs of its individual members. By the word Catholic in Ireland, there are many, many different types and grades. There are people who would use that term cultural Catholic uh, in that their families have been Catholics for generations, but they're not particularly interested in their faith. Catholic Church is, is a, a living religious faith. Uh, and if it's just a cultural icon that you use, uh, then perhaps, <laughs> perhaps you should go elsewhere. Uh, if it doesn't provide meaning in your life, then perhaps it's, it's, it's not for you. Um, I think people do need to look at the direction that the state has taken uh, in terms of its intolerance for diversity, its intolerance for Christian views, its intolerance for uh, the central role of the family uh, that is played in any Christian society. I think the attacks against the family, the whole transgender ideology, the gender ideology of allowing children to be um, have their genitals mutilated, um, without uh, any direction from their parents or from consulting their parents. That is coming to Ireland. It's absolutely frightening. Um, the concept of uh, gay marriage, I think, is, is an attack against the, the, the very meaning of the word uh, family and the very meanings of the word marriage, uh, which is, has no benefits whatsoever to the gay community. I don't like to use the term community because it's not really a community, but to, to homosexual people, uh, and most of whom are not particularly interested in it, uh, but it, it was used as a banner by the liberal left largely to attack the, the family structure. Um, I think the increasing attacks against the rights of parents within the family uh, to look after their own children, these are very, very worrying developments. Um, I think in, in terms of Catholic people, you've got to look at the social doctrines of the Catholic Church, the uh, importance of subsidiarity, and ask yourself, is our does our state provide for decision-making at the lowest possible level? Uh, our state has become a highly centralized state within a highly centralized superstructure of the European Union. Uh, and there's increasingly little role for the individual, for the small businessman uh, who is being attacked. It's you know, increasingly our employment is dependent on multinational corporations who seem to be able to dictate to government what they should and shouldn't do. And remember, a huge amount of the cultural attacks that are being made against the Irish people are being directed by multinational corporations. These are which will always have a socialist leaning. Um, it's a, people often think that private companies will not be socialist, but that's not the case. Large private companies tend to be very socialist in their orientation. Uh, it is only when you have an economy directed by the small businessman with respect for individual people that you can have genuine liberty. And the large multinational corporation is every bit as much of a threat to genuine democracy as is the centralized communist state. Well, it is very important. Um, younger people are very important. Young men are very important. Uh, increasingly, Ireland is becoming a very feminized society. Uh, politics is geared very much around women's needs as opposed to being around family needs. The, 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 you know, I've always felt it's a society which is not based around the needs of the heterosexual family is asking for serious trouble. Um, in many areas of employment, men are now second-class citizens, young men. Young men must be feeling this in particular. I suppose people of my generation grew up at a time when there was uh, reasonable equality of opportunity for men, but that's no longer the case, I think, in, in, in most public sector employment and even private sector employment. Uh, the quota system militates against uh, men with ability coming forward. Boys are discouraged from being masculine. You know, we, we, we will never hear any female uh, journalist in Ireland speak, using the term masculine without proceeding it with the term toxic or toxic masculinity. It's, those two words seem to go together. It's, it's almost as if being a masculine or being a man uh, is a poisonous and a dangerous thing. That's, that's certainly the way our society goes. That is the way most of our political parties think at the moment. And this is a very unbalanced um, situation. Uh, it, it, we need men and women working together. You know, we need both sides of the human personality. Uh, um, human masculinity, male masculinity is a very, very important thing, uh, particularly in terms of standing up to government. I think the reason that our governments push for that feminization of society and push for the denigration of the old masculine virtues is because they know that men will stand up and fight them. Women much less so. 
women can be belligerent, but they will not stand up to a centralized power of the state. Uh, they tend to be more collectivist. They tend to just want to have their needs looked after. Um, that is what women, you know, historically would have done. Uh, whereas men will look for improvements. They will look to stand up for rights. They will look for a, a decent and um, an open and a civilized, uh, a, a democratic and a liberal uh, society. And I don't mean liberal in the ways which it's used today. I mean liberal in the, in the classical Jeffersonian sense of that term. So I think, yes, it is very important to get young men involved. I think Ireland has uh, one of the highest young male suicide rates in the world of, of any country. It's a shocking, shocking statistic, which is never, ever mentioned. Uh, something like 90% of our suicides are male, uh, young men. It's a dreadful, dreadful thing. Uh, and it's something that we never question. We never even talk about it. It's, it's the elephant in the room that we simply don't mention. Uh, clearly, people when you when you consider that number of people who are committing suicide, what number of people are on the edge of it, or what you know, number of young men are in a state of despair? I think Jordan Peterson has spoken very well about this, and he has highlighted that issue. Um, and there are a lot of of men who see who feel very alienated from society, who are opting out of society, are opting out of the world of work because uh, they don't see any purpose, they don't see any hope in it. And this is where I think a Catholic uh, grounding can help people to understand what life is about and what society is about and what their role should be in society. I don't think politics is the entire answer. I think many people and the political parties encourage this. They, they, they try to persuade people that they can solve they can solve all problems. They can solve all problems. As and Jordan Peterson puts it very well, go and clean your room up first and then try and change the world. But until you know how to clean your room up, you ain't going to change the world. And it's a very good point. Until you can um, sort out your own life, you have no business trying to sort out the lives of others. Um, and if, for any politician to say that we can solve all problems in the society, it doesn't work that way. Society has to be transformed from within, from cultural organizations, from social organizations, such as, as you say, the domestic church, a strong family unit. And that's where it begins. And if you don't have that, it's going to be extremely difficult to bring up good people. Uh, I'm afraid I see a lot of young people now, and there's something missing. You know, it's, whether it's a broken family or, look, there are, great, there, are, there are many broken families with heroic parents who do their very, very best. But I do see a lot of young people who I would regard as suffering. Uh, there's some element missing in terms of socialization. They're not able to do it. There's a sense of hopelessness in some of them. Not all of them, but I do see that. I do see it more than I would have seen it, say, 30 years ago. But to come back to your question, many people, they take the opposite view that politics can solve nothing because we've had, you know, they've, they've been involved in democratic politics and they see it's getting us nowhere. It's actually doing a great deal of damage. We see in Ireland the, the proposal of our government to flood our country with open doors immigration is causing great, great difficulty for people who can't get housing. We have a major homeless problem in this country. And at that time, the government is introducing, in, in this year alone, the government is going to import 180,000 people, which is approximately 320% of the annual birth rate in Ireland in a single year. In, in, in the United States, that would be the equivalent of the 10 million persons per year coming in through an open, with no vetting, no assessment of employment needs, nothing like that. So the people who are struggling in Ireland are going to have to struggle far more. They're going to have to compete with people coming from low-wage economies. They will have to compete with them for housing and they're treated as second-class citizens. The Irish people are treated as second-class citizens for housing in this country. So many people are becoming very, very disillusioned with politics. But they, and, and many of them are deregistering their vote or not voting. But that's a terrible direction to take because politics will always be the source of legislative power. It, it, it won't solve everything, but it can solve some things. And if you, even if you can never find the right person to vote for, you'll never find any party which completely 100% represents all of your views. You'll never find any politician who will completely represent all of your views unless you're prepared to run yourself. No, we can't all be like that, unfortunately. Some people have to be foolish enough to try to do it. But if you can find almost the least bad option and vote for them, uh, at least they can nudge the politics in a certain direction. To me, the, the best role of a politician is often to do the, the, the least that he can and let people do the most that they can. He should, the politicians should get out of running too many things. They should let small businesses get on with running their affairs and not continually interfere with them, not continually put, impose quotas and over-regulation on them. We'd be very much a party of small business and deregulation. 
These were principles. I was in the United States in the year 1980, and those were buzzwords at the time. They seem to have disappeared. Um, that would be very much our focus, to, to concentrate on the small business, to concentrate on supporting working people, supporting families, and get back to a situation of a genuinely democratic uh, subsidiary state in Ireland, uh, a, a state which respects subsidiarity, where decision-making is carried out at the lowest possible level, that it can be carried out. Those would be the, fo the main foresight of our, our party. Um, of course, politics cannot solve all problems, but I think to abandon politics is to abandon democracy. Uh, the Athenian lawmaker Solon um, made it a crime in ancient Athens when, when democracy was being established. He made it a crime for people to shirk from engagement in public controversy because he, f he understood it was absolutely important for people to have a position on major public controversies. And that's, that's a good approach to have. Now in Ireland and in modern Europe, it becomes a crime almost to engage in a controversy. If you say anything controversial, you'll be cancelled, you'll, you'll, you'll be penalised for it. Uh, and that's, you know, we, we've gone from one extreme to the other. I, but I really do think it, it is, it's not just um, a right, it's an obligation of people to have an interest in politics, to have an interest in who they're electing, to interrogate them very, very carefully and very, very closely to make sure that, that, that you can find somebody who will vote in the right direction. And politicians will respond to people. They need your votes. If you say, look, I'm not going to vote for somebody who is uh, supporting mutilation of children in order to, to fund the profits of the medical profession. Sorry. <laughs> you know? And uh, you know, if people realize that you will not vote for them for that reason, then they will change their position. Uh, you might kind of find that cynical, but there are, I mean, look, a, a lot of politicians I find are very good people, but the democratic structures that we use, the party equipped system and so on and so forth, it directs them in the wrong direction. And I, I think when you have an overarching power like the European Union, which controls the funds to a large extent in Ireland and controls the politics, it becomes very, very difficult for individual politicians to, to take a principled stand. So we've got to help them to do that. And that's what we're trying to do in our party. I know there's a good deal of goodwill towards Ireland in the United States. I know that there's many, many people who are very proud of their Irish ancestry. Um, and I would ask you to, to look at our party, to see, to find out a bit more about our party. Uh, we, we will be coming to the States soon. We will be looking for some support because I can tell you uh, our country is under attack. It's under attack from its own political structure. It's under attack from the European Union. It's under attack from the same globalizing forces, the same cultural forces that you see in the United States. It's a difficult, difficult battle, uh, but we as Christians, as patriotic people, we cannot give up on this battle, and we have to continue to fight it. Um, most of the people in our party are part-time. Uh, we simply do the best we can for our country. Uh, we're not you know, I, I'm a practicing architect as well, so I have, I've limited enough time for this, but I'm not prepared to stand by and see my country being destroyed. Uh, so I would appeal to Irish America to um, consider us. Uh, we will be looking for your support in the near future, so um, hopefully you can help us out.